given the the conclusions you you're drawing or the theories you're drawing in 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 this book uh, how has it affected your behavior out there in the world and how has it affected your your kind of perception about existential risks and this sort of thing we're facing in our current day and age has it changed your behavior at all well it in terms of my perceptions of the world, it's been very, very slow because we didn't evolve. So now I'm putting on the evolution hat, right? So I'm, I'm, now I'm not using the conscious consciousness theory. I'm using the evolution by natural selection theory, right? So I should always tell you in what framework I'm talking because mm-hmm. otherwise it might sound like I'm contradicting myself, right? So, so from the point of view of evolution, <clears throat> there are no selection pressures for us to realize our state if we take everything that we see as the truth, we're fine, right? If it, so there's no selective advantage in, you know, getting through the day during the Pleistocene for oh, going, oh, wow, you know, that rock that I'm seeing, it's not real. It's just my, my user interface uh, icon. There, there were no selection pressures for that. And so that's why all of us are from early on in our childhood believe that what we see is the truth. Piaget, the very famous uh, uh, developmental psychologist, um, argued that we get what he calls object permanence when we're about 18 months of age. That the argument was that you know if you take a 17-month-old child and show it a doll, it plays with a doll, and if you take the doll and put it behind a pillow, even while the child is looking, the, the it doesn't see the the doll anymore, and it acts as though the doll ceased to exist. I can't see it, therefore it doesn't exist. But after 18 months, he argued, we get what he calls object permanence. We we get the insight that objects are real and exist even if we don't perceive them. So you put the doll behind the pillow and the baby crawls around and tries to get the doll from behind the pillow. It turned out that later experiments showed that um, PSJ was right, but it happens earlier than 18 months, probably around four months that that that, that infants actually get this object permanence. So so we've been shaped by evolution, according to Piaget and the developmental psychologist, to automatically get this belief that physical objects exist and persist even when they're not perceived. And we get it when we're four months old. So we can be excused if when we're grown up that it's hard for us to let go of something that was done to us before we could even argue against it. So, and it really takes like one of our best scientific theories, evolution by natural selection, and a theorem from that to sort of hit us in the face and go, whoa, maybe object permanence is not true. It's just something that evolution did to us, and it's not true. It's what we needed to stay alive, but it's we're not seeing the truth. So so that's why I'm not surprised that even though I've been dealing with this kind of idea for many decades now, for I've been at this for more than 30 years. thinking along this way. It's only been in the last few years, and maybe partly as a result of meditation, that I'm starting to live differently in my perceptions. As I drive, as I walk around, I'm starting to realize this is a headset. I'm starting to feel the headset for what it is. But it, it, it doesn't happen automatically, and, and most of the time, I'm back into, of course, I'm immersed in reality. But every once in a while, I get the, the experience of this is just a headset. Now, in terms of, you know, existential risks and so forth that you asked, and, and, and so forth, like right, right now we're all dealing with the coronavirus and, and, and so forth. <clears throat> well, this does lead to an interesting question about what is death and, and how does death affect our consciousness? And in the framework of physicalism that most of my colleagues um, adopt and, and which I adopted, um, your consciousness is a product of your brain. Now, as I said, we, they don't have any theory about how that happens, but, but that's the assumption. Consciousness is not primary from their point of view. The brain and physical systems are primary, and if they have the right kind of complexity, then consciousness emerges. On that scientific assumption, it follows quite clearly that when you die and your brain dies, then your consciousness ceases. There's there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. 
So physicalists do make important claims about human nature and the meaning of life and so forth. I mean, it's, it's wrong to say otherwise. Science is making claims in areas where we say these are spiritual issues like life after death. Science make, you know, physicalist science makes a very, very clear claim that there, there is no life after death. There's no consciousness after death. That's a very, very clear spiritual claim. Basically that there is no spirituality after death. <clears throat> that nothing survives. In this theory that I'm working on, and again, I preface everything that I say. I mean, it's, this is more important than the ideas, the particular ideas that I'm actually proposing is the attitude of, of course, I'm probably wrong. The whole point is to be precise so that we can figure out precisely where we're wrong. That's more important than anything else that I say is the non-dogmatic attitude and the goal of being absolutely precise and being willing to walk away from deeply held theories. And that, that's, that's more important than anything. And so, so in the, the model that I'm working on in which consciousness is fundamental, that model, since it doesn't say consciousness arises from the brain, allows the possibility that death is not, the death of the body is not the death of your consciousness. Think of it this way. Suppose that you're playing, um, you, you go to a virtual reality arcade with some friends and, and you put on, you know, VR headset and bodysuit and you're playing virtual volleyball. You see a virtual court and balls and, and maybe it's on the beach, see, tre see trees and sand and so forth. And you play virtual volleyball for a while and then one of your friends says, I'm thirsty, I need a drink, takes off his headset and bodysuit to get a drink and his avatar collapses in the sand. It's, it's, it's for all purposes in the interface, in the VR interface, it's lifeless. But he's not lifeless, he just stepped out of the interface. And so the idea that space-time is not fundamental, that space-time is doomed, that physical objects are not fundamental, and the idea that consciousness is fundamental leaves open the idea that the death of a person's body is merely the avatar. We're only seeing the avatar in our space-time interface. That has ceased to interact with our interface, but the consciousness can still persist. Now, there are open questions though within that framework. Does yourself with all of its memories persist? Mm -hmm. Or is that sort of an optional add-on that may not persist? That is one of the interesting questions that I want to look at. and and. We, you know, we might have, we all have skin in the game. We might have outcomes that we would like. <laughs> I would like to keep my memory of my family and, and my pets and so forth. But when we do the science, of course, we're human beings, we'll have our desires, but, but we've seen that humans have a consistent pattern of getting things wrong. We, we know what we want, we get it wrong and we're consistent. We're a hundred percent consistent at getting things wrong. And so that's why this non-dogmatic attitude of, okay, I know what I want it to be, but let's look at what the math and the logic and the best evidence that we have is telling us. So we'll see. Right now, the, the, this theory is saying consciousness survives, um, but is it my, do I, my memory survive? I don't know. I'll be very interested. I mean, I've got skin in the game just like you and I have what I'd like and don't like uh, about th that answer, but we just have to see um, where it leads. So it, and it does lead to interesting questions about morality um, that are very, very deep and about spirituality. I mean, I, I mentioned that um, there are infinite conscious agents that come out of this and not just one, but an infinite variety of infinite conscious agents and probably an infinite variety of different levels of infinity. It, it turns out that there's not just one kind of infinity. There are bigger and bigger infinities. There's an infinite number of different infinities. And that's a lot of people don't know that that infinity is not just one thing that there's a smallest infinity, which is uh, um, the cardinality of like the integers, the numbers you can count. <clears throat> the natural numbers or the integers.
And then there's the cardinality of the real numbers, which is a bigger one. And then you can keep going higher and higher infinities. And so it'll be interesting to explore, do, are there consciousnesses of, of all these higher levels of infinity? Um, and if so, you know, this is um, going to be a, a mathematically precise theory of, of what we've called in various traditions, something like God or, you know, the highest, whatever, whatever it might be. But it'll be a mathematically precise thing. We can ask precise mathematical questions. How many infinite consciousnesses are there? Is there a single greatest infinite consciousness? What's the relationship between that consciousness and finite consciousnesses? How much can finite consciousnesses understand about the infinite consciousness? I mean, these are now technical questions that we can ask. So we can have a scientific spirituality. So, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, uh, it, it should be fun because I think science and spirituality have been at odds <clears throat> for, for a long time. And I suspect that they will continue to be at odds, but, but the method of science and the spiritual insights from the spiritual traditions could come together. And of course, you know, I say that there are insights from the spiritual traditions, and I think there are. And of course, there's also nonsense, just like there's nonsense in scientific theories. And so we have to use the method of being non-dogmatic, being precise, looking for data to test our theories to find out what are the insights from the spiritual tradition? What's the nonsense? What's the insights from science? What's the nonsense? Um, you know, for, for example, the idea that space-time is fundamental, I think is nonsense. That, that's, that's nonsense. It's the nonsense that's guided us for, for several centuries is what we believed, but, but it, it appears to be false. Um, <clears throat> by the way, I should say, you, you might, someone might say, well, look, this is a cognitive scientist. He's talking about space-time being fundamental. Now, surely the physicists will put him in his place, right? I mean, this is this 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 is he's way out of his his, his you know roundhouse with this one. So what, what's going on? So it turns out I've used the phrase space-time is doomed several times, and that's because that's what several physicists are saying. So Nima Arkani Hamed, who's at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Um, is, has videos. If you Google space time is doomed, you can actually hear it from the physicist himself. Mm. You don't need to take it from a cognitive scientist. You can hear it from a physicist. He's got very technical lectures, but he also has public lectures that are pretty understandable to a general audience where he explains why physics is realizing that space time cannot be fundamental, that it doesn't work, and that our very best theories, you know, relativity theory, Einstein's theory of space-time and quantum field theory, together, actually, those theories are telling us that space-time is only an approximate concept. It's not a fundamental concept. So it's, and, and I'll just give a hint of one of the ideas about why it's just approximate. When you try to measure things in space at finer and finer precision, like like with a microscope, you know, but, but a really powerful microscope. There's something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which says that the smaller you look, the more energy it takes. And so that's no problem. You just crank up the energy, right? And we, you know, we can soup up more and more and look smaller and smaller. But, but then when there's a problem when there's gravity, because at some point you put so much energy into such a small space when you're looking smaller and smaller that with gravity, you destroy space time itself. You literally destroy space time. You create a black hole. It happens at, it happens at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That's pretty small. So an, an atom is about 10 to the minus eighth centimeters. A proton is about 10 to the minus 14th centimeters. The innards of a proton, the quarks and gluons, are about 10 to the minus 17th centimeters. So 10 to the minus 33 is about as small compared to a proton as a proton is to us. So that's really small. But nevertheless, the mathematics of quantum mechanics and general relativity, when you put them together, entail that space-time ceases to be operationally usable concept after 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. It doesn't work. So is that approximately uh, what you would describe uh, the size of a pixel in our interface? 
Uh, right. It, 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 you could think of it that way, but, but there is a, an important technical um, caveat on that. What, what the physicists are, are, they're not saying that there are pixels of space time. So they're not saying that. And, and the reason that they can't say that is sort of technical, but a pixel would have a fixed size, right? You, you would have a little size. And it turns out you can't do that and be what's called Lorentz invariant. So you couldn't have Lorentz invariant pixels. So, so we know that the idea, and, and no one I think wants to let go of Lorentz invariants when you're talking about space time. So Lorentz invariance is what, what Einstein discovered when he discovered this, that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. When you actually cash out what it means to say nothing can go faster than the speed of light, you get what's called Lorentz invariance of space and time. That's, that's, that's sort of a technical thing. So you, there are no pixels. It's better to just say that the very concept of space and time disappear. Mm. They're no longer operational. It would be actually a wrong picture to think that there are just pixels at the smallest scale. Um, but there is, you know, there is the Planck area and there's something called the holographic principle. And it looks like a weird thing about space. And I'll, I'll, may, I'll say this because it will shake people's intuitions up. It'll make you think, okay, maybe everything I've believed is deeply false. It, so here, here's, the, here's the idea. How much, if I had a volleyball, and I want to put like you know data inside the volleyball. And I ask you know how much how much information could you stick inside that the volume of that volleyball? You might say, well, I could put a five terabyte hard drive in there today, and next year maybe I could put a ten terabyte hard drive. And so the question is, is there an in principle maximum amount of information you could stick inside the volume of that volleyball? And it turns out physicists have answered that question. And in fact, it was Stephen Hawking who answered that question. And he discovered there is a maximum limit and it does not depend on the volume of the volleyball. It depends only on the surface area. The amount of information you can store into a region of space depends only on the area, not the volume. And if that hurts, if that seems really counterintuitive, then you understand the problem. Space is not a real container in which you stick stuff like pouring milk into a glass. It, it's a data structure that you use that evolution is <clears throat> putting on the evolution hat. It's the data structure that we've evolved that uh, lets us get through the day and it's not the truth. And it's definitely not a pre-existing stage on which the drama of life plays out. So I'm saying space is not fundamental. Space time is doomed. That means the big bang story the universe started with the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. That's not deeply true because space time is doomed. So, space time isn't the final reality. So, the Big Bang, which is the origin of space time in that story, can't be the final story. We, we need a deeper story. Whatever deeper story we come up with, and the, work, the one I'm working on with my colleagues is this network of conscious agents, what we have to show is how. What looks like space time emerges. We have to get back quantum field theory and general relativity. We have to show why it looks like there's a big bang. In other words, we, we can't just throw this stuff away. I mean, quantum field theory and, and relativity theory and, and all the science, I'm not saying, oh, it's all nonsense, throw it away. Absolutely not. I'm, I'm saying it's fantastic where it works and it works in a lot of places, but it has limits. And so we need a deeper theory and a constraint on our deeper theory of consciousness. And this is what's really powerful. You know, how do you get a theory of consciousness? How do you get empirical data to constrain a theory of consciousness? Well, one source will be whatever theory of the network of conscious agents that I propose and my, my team proposes and the dynamics, when we project it back into a space-time interface, we have to get back quantum field theory and general relativity and the Big Bang and evolution by natural selection as the projection of our deeper dynamics. If we can't do that, then our deeper theory of consciousness is wrong. So I'm not like saying some crank thing that, well, we're just throwing away all this, you know, centuries of science. Absolutely not. It's really important what we've got in, in science. It is a boundary constraint on a deeper theory. And if we can't get back our current science, from a theory of consciousness, then we will have to modify our theory of consciousness. So that's, so that's the, the spirit in which I'm, I'm doing this.
The brand new Future Thinkers Members Portal is now live. Develop your sovereignty and self-knowledge with our in-depth courses, get access to our weekly sense-making calls, join the Q&As with past podcast guests, and much more. Become a Future Thinkers member today at futurethinkers.org slash members. Enter the Future Thinkers giveaway and win our brand new community membership, including in-depth courses, private calls, and more, as well as a supply of Qualia, a complete cognitive upgrade for your brain. To enter the contest, simply go to futurethinkers.org slash giveaway and sign up for our mailing list to instantly get our 50-page guide on how to adapt to the future. There are many ways to increase your chances of winning. Enter the competition today.